Thanks, James. You'll have to bear with me. I'm a bit croaky this evening. But um, we've arrived at the end of the book of James, last eight verses. And in the five chapters that we've seen so far, James has given us a deeply challenging overview of the Christian life. If you've been here, I I guess you'll you'll have felt the challenge. Don't just read the Bible, do what it says. Be careful with your words. Don't show favoritism. Persevere through life's great trials. Trust your tomorrows to God. Be wary of wealth. There's loads in here, but as you get to the end of the letter, you're kind of thinking, well, James, have you forgotten something? Key part of the Christian life, and he's hardly mentioned it so far. Any thoughts? What's been missing? Anyone going to go for it? Prayer. Prayer. Well done, Freddie. Prayer. You think James has hardly mentioned prayer at all. I read through. I could find um, chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 4, verse 3. They're they're sort of tangential references to prayer, but that's all we've got. James has been silent on the topic. So it's no surprise, as he gets to the end of his letter, he finishes by thinking through the place of prayer in the Christian life. That's not a surprise. But what he says is a surprise. I reckon these are probably the most challenging verses in the whole letter. So I'm going to pray, and then Susan's going to come and read it for us, and we'll think it through together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can pray, that we have access to your heavenly throne room because of the work of your Son. And we pray, merciful Lord, that you would help us now as we look through the last few verses of this letter. Please help us to hear, and please teach us to pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, So the reading is from James chapter 5, uh, verses 13 to 20, page 1216. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susan. Now, there's lots here. We're going to dive straight in because time is tight. We're going to share bread and wine together. Um, I just want to walk through these verses, and I want us to notice five surprises in these verses. Our first surprise, which shouldn't really be a surprise. We know this, but we constantly forget it. Surprise one, prayer is for the good times as well as for the tough times. Prayer is for the good times as well as the tough times. You'll know which prayer you're more likely to pray. God, I desperately need your help here. Oh God, I'm deeply thankful for this good thing. You know which of those prayers you're more likely to pray. If you're anything like me, you're much more likely to pray when you're in trouble than when things are going well. So notice how James begins. He says, if anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. Well, that's good, no doubt about it. If things are tough, prayer's a good thing to do. But how does James continue? If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise which is what we've been doing. It's good to to praise God for who he is and all that he's done. 
But ask yourself, is that just a Sunday thing? Is that just a sort of gathering with God's people thing? Or is it a pattern of life? Are you in the habit of regularly thanking God for who he is and all that he's done? My old vicar, when he was interviewing someone for, for a job in the church, he would, um, he would say to them, how long did you spend praising God for who he, who he is this morning? Now, that's a pretty mean question when you're having a job interview, particularly given that probably what they were praying about that morning was the job interview. <laughs> But actually, it's very revealing. Are we people who just ask God for things? Or are we people who are delighted in who God is and all that he has done for us and we want to praise him for it? Prayer is for the good times as well as the tough times. And then our second surprise is that prayer works. Prayer works, which is significant because the main focus of this letter has been on patient endurance. We had it last week, chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. Until the Lord's coming. You hear it? Patient endurance. Or right back at the start of the letter, Nolsey reminded us of it earlier. Chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. See, this letter is a letter about perseverance, about waiting for Jesus Christ's return. It's very easy to read the letter and to be left thinking, well, is that it? Is there nothing I can do in my struggles right here and now? James's response, verse 14, is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now that is good news, isn't it? This is not just grin and bear it. God is not detached from our hardships now. He, he's not like the uncaring parent who sort of says, oh, sorry son, life is tough, just get on with it. <laughs> the all-powerful creator God, he is intimately involved in every detail of your life. Whatever the struggle is for you right now, God knows it. And he can... And he will miraculously intervene in the brokenness of our world to bring about redemption, to bring about healing. We must believe that. The Bible is very clear. But we also need to be careful. Notice the language here. We're told, is any, anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church. So notice, it is the sufferer who calls for the prayer. It's not a prayer hit squad, sort of wandering around looking for anyone they can find to pray for. And it's the elders of the church who have been called to do the praying, which is surprising. Why the senior leadership of the church? Why not those with the spiritual gift of healing that 1 Corinthians 12 talks about? That would seem more logical, wouldn't it? I've been puzzling about this um, this week. Here's where I got to. There is great spiritual danger in these verses. You'll know that. Listen to verse 15 again. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. That's a difficult verse. I had a friend at college, Christian friend, and her mum was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Just, just a few months left to live. My friend prayed and prayed and prayed. She fasted. She got other people praying. She was fully convinced that God could and would heal her mum. But her mum died, and my friend was crushed. And she wasn't just crushed through, through grief, she was crushed through spiritual despondence. Why didn't God heal her mum? There's spiritual danger here. And so God instructs the spiritually mature to undertake this ministry. It's, it's not that there won't be others who are spiritually mature in the church, but the elders of the church, if rightly chosen, they will be spiritually mature. That's what we should be looking for in our church leadership. So it's the elders who gather around to pray for the sick. And what do they do? You notice that they anoint with oil. Nothing magical about the oil. It's a picture of asking for God's special blessing on this person's body. And they pray in faith. That's verse 15. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now, we really need to be careful here, because what is faith? Ask yourself, what is faith? Faith is trusting in the one who can do 
what we cannot do. But we very easily hear this verse and start to tell ourselves that it's all about us. Have I got enough faith? That's what crushed my friend back at college. She was left thinking, oh, I can't have had enough faith. I can't have been praying right. But that's trusting yourself. What you can do is not trusting the Creator God. The prayer of faith is a prayer which says, Lord, we, we can't help in this situation. We are utterly powerless. We depend entirely on you. And we're going to trust you to do what is ever, whatever is, is good and pleasing to you. The verse is not a spiritual guarantee. It's not a spirituality test. I mean, actually think about it. The Apostle Paul. Um, Paul was not a man lacking in faith. I assume we agree on that. And yet, he had what he described as a thorn in the flesh. We're not told what it was, some physical impairment. And he says, three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And God did not heal Paul. Patient endurance was, was the answer that Paul got. But God does heal. He, he can heal. He does it using ordinary means, medical skills, surgical skills. We've been praying that for Olive this week as she's had her operation. But he also does it through extraordinary means. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. So to get the tension, we've got to pray boldly, but we've got to pray carefully. But prayer does work. And then the third surprise. Third surprise, our bodies and souls are closely connected. Now, as you can tell, I've had man flu this week. And women, you won't understand this. Man flu is an awful thing, close to death. <laughs> um, but it's been a funny thing this week. Being unwell, I found praying really hard. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Now, why is that? Why should a physical struggle result in a spiritual struggle? That's not the way we typically see ourselves, is it? We, we, you know, this body is just bone, flesh, and blood. It, the soul is a separate thing. And yet, as we see the highs and lows of life play out, we realize we're much more complex than that. And verse 16 picks up this interconnectivity. Have a look down. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you hear the surprise there? It's not saying what we're expecting it to say. Have a listen again. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Not forgiven, healed. That's puzzling. We need to be clear what the verse isn't saying. This, um, this isn't talking about the last rite. So a Catholic tradition of a priest attending a dying person in the last hours of their life and anointing them with oil, hearing their confession and pronouncing the forgiveness of sins. That, that tradition is built on these verses. And, and it, it comes with an understanding that if you take unconfessed sin into death, that's the problem. But is that right? Hebrews 9 tells us Jesus came once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. The picture is of past, present, and future sins all forgiven if you're trusting in Jesus Christ. If you cling to that faith with your final breath, your sins are already forgiven. And actually, if you look at this verse, that's not what's being spoken of. This, the person who's being prayed for is not expecting that they'll die. The expectation is that they're going to be healed. It's not about last rites. You're very welcome to call me if you're dying, but you don't need me to pronounce forgiveness of sins. If you're trusting in Jesus, he's done that. He's done that. This verse also isn't saying that personal sickness is directly linked to personal sin. Just because I got man flu this week, it doesn't necessarily mean that God was disciplining me for some area of sin in my life. Actually, Jesus makes that crystal clear in John 9 when he's healed a man who was born blind and he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We've got to be clear on that. You can see how easily you could go wrong. 
but our souls and bodies, they are closely connected. When your body is sick, your soul is affected. When your soul is sick, when you're caught in some habitual pattern of sin, when you've been hurt by someone else's sin, sometimes your body is affected. We know that. Sickness always reminds us of the brokenness of this world, brokenness which comes about because of human sinfulness. So verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And actually, I love the fact that it's each other here. That's surprising, isn't it? It's surprising you call the church elders to pray for healing, but when you're confessing your sins, surely that's when you need a priest. But no, confess your sins to each other. This is Christian believer and Christian believer standing alongside each other, helping each other through life to live for Christ. So ask yourself, have you got that person? Have you got someone who who you trust enough to talk about your failings, someone who loves you enough, who will challenge you when they see you wandering from the narrow path. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And notice how the verse continues. The the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, which which makes you think, well, if I'm going to get someone to pray for me, I'm going to make sure I get the holiest person I know most righteous person. Is that how you read it? Well, here's the prize for every Christian can be a powerful and effective prayer. Every Christian can be a powerful and effective prayer. Because we're not being told here to go and find the holiest person we know. We're being reminded what Jesus has done. That's what this verse is about. As our creator God looks at this room, he only has two categories of righteousness. You and I are either covered In Jesus' righteousness, through faith in him, you're made clean because Christ died for you at the cross. Or you are covered in the filth of your sin. Not a hint of righteousness. It's either or. And there's nothing in between. That is it. No subcategories. So when James says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, he's saying, Christian believer, know the power that God has given to you in prayer. If you think I'm pushing this too far, have a look how it continues. Verse 17, he says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced his crop. So easy to to look at Elijah and, and to sort of picture him in this sort of other category. Super spiritual dude. I'm nothing like him. Maybe you walk into a church and you do that. You look at other people, other Christians, and you think, I could never be like them. Never going to be as spiritual as them. But just two categories. And what are we told? Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He was like you and me. And yet he prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. A powerful and effective prayer. It's significant that God had promised this would happen if if his people wandered away from him. So Elijah prayed with confidence. He prayed knowing he was praying according to God's word. But God heard and answered that prayer. When you realize just just how incredible this is, just how powerful this is, you, you look at your life and you think, I'd be stupid not to pray. We spend so much time worrying about things and so little time praying about them. So much time talking through situations with other people. So little time talking to our God about them. But Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Every Christian believer can be a powerful and effective prayer. And then finally, our fifth surprise, prayer saves lives. Prayer saves lives. Last two verses of the letter. This is where James lands his letter. They they must be important words. He writes, verse 19, he says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Now I found out this week, 
uh, that another mate of mine, Christian man, family man, in church leadership, um, but he's abandoned his wife and kids. He, he's, he's run off with another woman, had to resign from his job. Totally heartbreaking. And it's hit me hard. You, you sort of replay the conversations. And you're left thinking, you know, sh- should I have noticed? Should I, what did I ask him? Should, should I have pushed him harder on this or that? But then the next emotion was fear. Because I was left thinking, this could so easily be me. It could so easily be you. See, the point of this verse is that you and I have hearts that wander from the truth. We so easily drift into sinful patterns. That's why God puts us in churches, in small groups, in youth groups, whatever it might be. He's saying we need Christian sisters and brothers around us to keep pulling us back as we wander. And here he's urging us. He's saying, love each other enough that you care about each other's eternities. That's the death that's being spoken of here. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death. I don't think it's an earthly death that's primarily in view there. It's an eternal death. It's eternal separation from God and his blessings because we've wandered away from the truth and no one pulled us back. So three questions for us. Will we, will we prayerfully and carefully ask each other the hard questions? If we're worried about a Christian brother and sister, we're just going to keep quiet or will we lovingly challenge them? Will we pray for those who are wandering? Remember, this is the context of prayer. He says this, will we pray for friends who are walking away from God? I've been praying for my mate this week. Will we pray? But I wonder, hardest of all, will we be people who allow others to challenge us? If a Christian friend comes up to you and just graciously challenges you, asks you some questions. How are you going to respond? Are you going to go for the how dare you? Or will you go for a thank you? Because nothing matters more than your eternity. That's been the focus of the whole letter. That's why James begins his letter with these extraordinary words. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Those words are nonsense unless eternity matters more than the here and now. And that that is the heartbeat of this book. Live for eternity. Live for eternity. Let me um, finish with a a story from this week. It's a safe story um, with a tricky passage. Um, Tuesday morning, I, um, I wanted to think through this topic of prayer, so I put my coat and headphones on and I went out for a walk in, in Trent Park. I thought, I'll listen to a few talks on prayer. I'll do some praying. Long walk all around Trent Park. And um, later in the day, I put my coat back on and um, I noticed I normally keep my wallet in the top pocket here. And I sort of tapped it there. My wallet wasn't there. And so I opened my coat and the, the zip was undone. No wallet. Replay my steps. A lot of steps. And um, so what do I do? I jump on my bike, and I start bombing around Trent Park, trying to retrace my, my steps. And um, the dusk was coming, light was fading. I'm looking for a brown leather wallet in a brown wood. <laughs> Turns out that's quite hard. But you know what? As I was cycling, I suddenly realized the irony, because what had I done that morning? I'd gone out to think about the topic of prayer. And what was I doing now? I was panicking, cycling like fury, and I hadn't stopped and prayed. So I got off my bike, and I prayed. I prayed earnestly. For various reasons, I really needed that wallet back. I prayed faithfully, I hope, trusting that I couldn't find the wallet. I'd prove that, but knowing that God could. And as I prayed, you know what happened? I remembered that part around my walk, I'd sat down on this this fallen down tree to pray. And so I thought, I'm going to go back to that tree. So I jump back on my bike, cycle to the tree. And as I get to the tree, cycle to the tree, get off my bike, walk to the tree, do you know what I found? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> it wasn't there. My wallet was well and truly lost. And um, I really thought it would be there. I remembered that tree as I was praying. But then I realized, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Now, that was a tiny little moment, although if you find my brown leather wallet, I'd love to have it back, but <laughs> tiny trial in life. God could have answered that prayer, but he chose not to, because actually God wanted to teach me something different on Tuesday. He wanted to teach me something that mattered about eternity, rather than just dealing with an inconvenience in the here and now. He can answer prayer, but he won't always. But he will always do what is best for our eternities. So we can pray with confidence. Shall we pray now? Oh, we praise you, loving Father, that you know all the details of our lives and you are powerful to work in all of them. There is nothing that any of us in this room are struggling with, are going through, that is outside of your knowledge, that is apart from your love, and that sits outside of your sovereign, powerful rule. Lord our God, help us, we pray, to be a prayerful people, a faithful people, who depend on you, not on ourselves. But please, God our Father, we want to be people living for eternity. We want to gather together, every one of us round the throne of your Son, singing great praise on that day. So please, build us up as a community. Help us to care well for each other. To hold each other to account. To allow others to hold us to account. So that none may wander away. And all may know, with great joy, the glory of that final day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.